Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yang Ki Kim. I'm professor of physics at the University of Chicago and president of the Korean American Scientists and Engineers Association, KSEA. Today is International Women's Day, uh, which was officially recognized by the uh, United Nations in 1977. This year's theme by the UN stresses the need for technology and innovation to advance gender equality. Currently, women make up under a third of the workforce in science, technology, engineering, and math STEM. Investing in women uplifts all people, communities, and countries. And I believe that all of us across governments, private sectors, and societies need to work together to build a more inclusive, just, and prosperous world for women, girls, men, and boys, and boys everywhere. As for KSEA, I would like us to work together towards a KSEA becoming a diverse, inclusive, and equitable community, exemplary to others. And today's event is towards uh, achieving this goal. And this event is jointly hosted by KSEA and KYS, Korean American Women in Science and Engineering. The theme of this evening is leadership and allyship towards gender equality. And we are honored to have a Sun, Sun Mi Jin from Indiana University as our guest. Sun Mi Jin serves for the I Can Persist ICP STEM initiative as an instructor, teaching a course designed to empower women of color in STEM majors and to address the application of STEM for social and environmental justice. She has published and worked on the success of diverse students and faculty in higher education, particularly in STEM disciplines. She has previously worked as a faculty development researcher and she is currently a core leader for the faculty development track at the Assessment Institute. Please join me in welcoming Sun Mi Jin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen, my slide well? Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me once again to this seminar today, especially when celebrating the International Women's Day. And I'm very honored to share my presentation with you, whom I have utmost respect for your work in the area of STEM and in our society. And um, as um, President Young Ki Kim introduced, I uh, am currently an instructor for I Can Persist STEM Initiative, uh, teaching an inter interdisciplinary course on how to apply STEM knowledge to address social and environmental justice for undergrad female students of color, specifically majoring in STEM in, at Indiana University. Um, so these are like brief backgrounds of mine, uh, but I want to also share the kind of question that I often ask uh, through my work. So I often have to ask, um, how can we make sure women of color uh, can get the best learning environment in college so that they can persist and thrive? And how can universities and reward the work of women of color equally as other men? And um, these questions that I ask daily for my work, and these questions are also very relevant to talk about with you today as we celebrate International Women's Day. And so before jumping into the presentation, I want to share the agenda for today. Um, so we'll be talking about significance of International Women's Day by celebrating our achievements. And then we're gonna talk about the action items that we can take to make, uh, to improve that gender equity in the field of STEM. 
So International Women's Day was officially sponsored by United Nations to celebrate women's work in achieving voter rights across various countries. And then four years later in 2013, the United Nations promulgated the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which we celebrated last month on February 11th. And Women uh, in STEM have made great scientific contributions and also collectively worked hard to be seen in STEM and promote gender equity in addition to their own work and research. So for example, courageous female professors in STEM majors put together the MIT report that addressed institutionalized discrimination against female faculty in STEM majors at MIT through its policy and practices. However, with, even with those efforts, female scientists and students are not getting the same recognition for their contribution to the fields and a higher percentage of women and women of color leave STEM disciplines and industry, industry than men do. So in fact, this is a list of international days and uh, uh, the United Nations has promulgated. So I researched how many <laughs> international days we have. And there are like 130 international days sponsored by UN. And we have um, seven international days um, that talks about address gender equity out of 130. And one of them is about women in science. So this, on the other hand, suggest that gender equity in STEM is a worldwide issue that are also related to women's rights, uh, which we really have to care about. Then our question is, how can STEM disciplines and industry move forward to gender equity, ensuring that equal opportunities are given to women to succeed and thrive in, the, in their fields? Uh, so before jumping into this conversation, I want to briefly go over some words um, that I'm going to use a lot because, you know, I come from social science and there may be terms that are not used very much uh, in STEM. So I thought it might be good to like just go over some um, words. So minority, uh, we often use it as minoritized, minor marginalized instead of using minority because minority is minority because they are minoritized by the dominant group. So, uh, and then women of color, I also use it as women with racially minoritized identities like black African women and Asian American women, um, Hispanic women and so on. So, and then another word that I often use is underrepresentation of women and marginalization of women uh, throughout the presentation. All right. So um, the first agenda that I suggest for STEM is to take culturally relevant approaches. Um, culturally relevant approach is used in different terms in education, like culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally relevant education or teaching. And if you see this diagram here, culture can be categorized by dominant culture and there are various subcultures. And some of the subcultures exist with countercultures that do not align much with the dominant culture. And often minoritized, minoritized groups tend to have aspects of counterculture, meaning they can have different values from those of dominant culture. And there is often cultural incongruence between the dominant groups and minoritized groups. So culturally relevant approach can be defined as becoming aware of norms and values of minority communities, their subculture and countercultures, and validating respecting diverse cultural values of students and their motivation to pursue STEM. Um, so we are going to apply that diagram to the culture of STEM discipline and industry. Um, so let's say STEM culture as dominant culture on the left, and culture is often described with the salient culture values. So based on the previous studies, um, literature, the discipline culture, disciplinary culture of STEM are often described, they are based on modernism, positivism, 
and human capital capital orientation. So focusing on skillifying students to build their capital um, and covering contents as much as possible also to develop their capital to become a scientist or engineers. And uh, understanding abstract ideas and competition, all these uh, values are widely described as characteristics of STEM culture. And women and racial minoritized students tend to bring their cultural values such as communal orientation, knowledge to serve communities, um, application to real world situation, um, relational aspects, equity, equality. Um, and these values, um, such as communal orientations, they do exist uh, in dominant culture too. But the point here is that these values are more salient, important for women and racially minoritized individuals. And these values are often identified as stronger motivation to pursue STEM degrees, particularly for women of color in STEM uh, in the US uh, based on studies. So this is because this is largely because how women and racial minorities are socialized uh, differently from dominant culture. And the difference in the culture values, we call it as cultural incongruence. So I think it's a good time to use real life example to apply the concept of cultural relevancy. So I earlier mentioned I teach a course with the I Can Persist STEM initiative. And in my course, all students are female with racially minoritized identities like Black, um, Asian American students, female students. And they come from various majors in STEM. So in the class, we often have discussion uh, about how we can use our STEM knowledge to improve social and environmental justice. And one of the topics we recently talked about was um, nail salon workers, the nail salon workers in the US. And they're mostly Hispanic and Southeast Asian women uh, who are, and they tend to ex be exposed to nail products for a length period of time, and they commonly develop cancers. But not much is done about uh, this due to lack of scientific studies proving the evidence of the relationship between the length exposure to certain chemicals uh, and types of cancer the nail salon workers commonly get. So we had discussions on um, this kind of thing. And I had students, Michelle, named Michelle, junior students. Um, and she's very bright and active in class discussion. and. She's like so passionate about talking about all this. Um, so I asked her one time if she's like this passionate in other classes in her major. And she said, I'm usually very quiet in my class in STEM major, my own major. People rarely see me talking and we don't talk about these things. So I was very surprised to hear it um, because and so many scholars in science and education point out that why and how women and racial minorities students do the science is often not reflected and recognized in STEM education and work. So Samuel and Hewitt are very renowned scholars who have investigated why women and minoritized students leave STEM. And this is a quote from the student interviews in their study. A big concern of a lot of Black students is we feel like we are being prepared to go into white corporate America, and it won't really help our community. We won't have the opportunity through our careers to give back to community. Anything that we do for the community will be outside of our academic field, and that is very serious concern. Um, so. Another evidence from my own study that I've conducted in South Korea, the types of learning and interactions that were more influential were different form, uh, different from male students to uh, develop 
female students' career aspirations. So collaborative learning that is not based on competition and real life relevancy in contents were more influential, influential to develop career aspiration for female students in STEM majors. So we see some uh, cultural factors playing into the learning and development of students by gender and also race. So then what? culturally relevant actions can be taken here. So these are some suggestion comes from my perspective. So incorporating service learning, community engaged learning in STEM majors, including faculty work in those areas and reward them uh, for their promotion um, and create, maybe creating one credit course on application of STEM for social justice or including discussions on that topic in the classrooms and assuring and appreciating the conversation on altruistic application of STEM research and work uh, in the industry. So next agenda is avoiding stereotyping, but encouraging STEM identity instead. So um, this section, I'd like to start with a situation first. Um, so for example, Kim as a Korean American graduate student in environmental science. She's really smart and have contributed to the project a lot along with other students. And one day the supervisor, the PI compliments Kim saying, thanks Kim, you're such a good organizer, uh, but never complimented about her actual work, but happened to say something nice about her that day. Someone may have question here, what's the problem with that compliment? Um, so to help the answer, to, uh, to help answer this question, let's think about whether this compliment helped Kim or others to view Kim as a better STEM professional. So let's take a look at this STEM professional identity diagrams. Uh, STEM professional identity measurement is developed to measure how much of student identity overlaps with STEM professional identity. So the higher number, like six or seven students choose, the more likely that the students continue to be in STEM. And can you think about what are certain traits of good STEM professionals? Maybe you can drop in the chat to like, what are the good traits, uh, qualities you can have to become a good researcher or a good engineer uh, in STEM field? Analytical skills, yes. Thank you. I see me and Dr. Jun. Yeah, problem solving skills. In the chat, I'm seeing the um, responses. Yes. And also, yeah, logical thinking, creativity. Maybe we can have two more. Persistence. critical thinking. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, so the more you can associate yourself with these skills, you will have better STEM professional identities. Um, but can you then, can you see organizing skills? Um, yeah, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, but then for Asians generally, um, Asians are generally stereotyped as smart and hardworking, but when it comes to Asian American women, very common stereotypes are like office mother who organizes the lab of lab and office, passive being passive, meaning that they want to address their opinions first, um, and they are seen as so dutiful wives and daughters, um, also based on researches. Um, so the compliment to Kim that she was good at organize, organization does not necessarily help Kim to develop stronger um, STEM professional identity, but may reinforce strip stereotyping of Asian American women. So the better way to say, or way to compliment Kim is, for example, thank you for helping with organizations, I appreciate your detail orientation. 
Or you can say, thank you for helping with the organization. That's an extra work you did in addition to your contribution that you made for the project. So uh, I highlight the part and those parts are the ways that we can connect our complements to the professional identity in STEM. Um, so my suggest for, suggestion for encouraging STEM professional identities is to be conscious of how, sorry, to be conscious of how your words can direct students or mentees to develop stronger STEM professional identities. Um, so this is the last agenda, but not the, not the least. So I want to introduce the concepts of counter space and upstander. This one, I'll start with the story of Dr. Hopkins. Um, so when she started her faculty career at MIT, she found that male faculty, although they were lower ranked than her, received larger laps. And she would receive uh, mistreatments even from the graduate students in the department. So she requested changes in the department, but those suggestions were rejected and belittled. And she was the only female faculty in that department. So she questioned herself, is it me who is creating all these discomforts, uh, who is wrong? Um, so after repeated microaggressions and prejudice, women and racially minor minoritized STEM individuals begin to question themselves. So they also, they often lack a supportive network to talk about their experiences together. So, but then um, Dr. Hopkins formed a small group of senior women faculty in the science department at MIT. And they found that they were all frustrated with being unable to gain the space or resources need to pursue their research. Um, and those resources were actually readily available to other male junior faculty. So they started together regularly to vent uh, and discuss discrimination that they experienced with the fellow female scientists. Um, so, you know, in the glacier, you can see there's um, visible experience discriminations, but there are very subtle invisible discriminations that minorities in STEM experiences. So um, they started talking and sharing their experiences around this um, because when they share these with men or departments, these experiences are often not empathized and neglected. And through their conversations, they were also able to come up with actions, pl action plans to address gender inequity at their institutions. So this is an example of counter space. Counter space is academic and social safe spaces for minoritized students and individuals so they can vent frustrations and to promote their own values and ways of learning in that way that these, um, these ways are validated and to challenge the deficit notion of women and people of color and establish um, positive climate for themselves. And so STEM majors and organizations, companies, and companies uh, can invest in supporting women to create a counter space for them. And the last action item is to become upstander. The word upstander comes from standing up for others instead of being bystander. So there is a wonderful documentary titled Picture a Scientist. The documentary tells stories of women, of women in STEM and their journeys to tackle the sexism and racism in the field of STEM. And there's in their stories, um, their male, male colleagues stood up with them. And in one of the stories, Dr. Jane uh, Willenbring wrote a letter to the association in her field to report um, sexual harassment by uh, done by a renowned scholar in the field for a lengthy time. Uh, and one of her male colleagues said, I thought she was okay because she never said anything. But later I learned that she was not. So I decided to write the support letter for her. And 
there are different stories of male colleagues standing up for women raising voices in the documentary. And to become a bystander, um, these are things to try and list, uh, recognize when something is wrong uh, for the victim and respectively intervenes to educate and promote civil and professional conduct and raises awareness about the behaviors uh, to prevent the situation from happening again. Um, sorry, I think, did you hear knocking behind me? Sorry, yeah, because I have a daughter like who's trying to come into my room. So I just want to make sure uh, there was no, like not a big noise, yeah. All right, thank Why you. Why didn't you invite her? <laughs> That'd be great, but she's very cranky at this moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you for your invitation though. I'm, I really appreciate it. Um, so um, that was uh, my presentation and these are the some key takeaways uh, and things to uh, think about. And so for rapid improvements in gender diversity in STEM, efforts should be made to reflect various cultural values and women uphold and intrinsically motivate them. And considering STEM identity, we should ask ourselves, does my remark contribute or hurt the other STEM professional identity? And supporting women's network and intervening when biases occur uh, by being upstander. And I want to ask all of us um, to think about these questions um, like for the further discussions. In what ways can the STEM industry, can academia take culturally responsive approaches? And how can your efforts for diversity in STEM contribute to your own career? And I just want to let you know these um, um, research are very meaningful and useful for you to take a look later uh, in your own time. Yeah, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a pretty complete uh, list with uh, within a relatively short uh, time. Uh, very uh, helpful uh, take out take home messages. Uh, let's take one or two questions since we'll have a panel discussion so you can address some of those uh, comments or questions later but if there's any urgent question you can raise a hand using zoom uh raise a hand the uh symbol I don't see that. So since again, we can discuss more uh, through the panel conversation. So uh, Professor Chayang Kim, uh, now I'll turn to you and, and you can introduce yourself and panel and we can, we can start. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me share my screen very quickly. Nice to see you guys. Um, so um, so glad to see everyone was able to join us this evening or morning, depending on where you are. Um, also, happy International Women's Day today, and really a pleasure to be celebrating with all of, all of you. So this is panel discussion with women leaders around the STEM field. Um, career development, is especially and the insight. We want to have some insight from would you. Would you mind um, using, ah, better. Okay, good. Yeah, um, the, some insight. Let's share some insight and experience from your journey to the career, uh, especially in the STEM field. So, okay. So I am Jayan Kim from USAID and I'm also past uh, immediate past president of KYS and KYS was nonprofit organization as you know. And we have a lot of activities related to the women to support and promote women um, uh, science, test and engineer activities, career development, also um, networking between 
women scientists, of course, we also have a lot of collaborative activity with KSCA about, um, you know, um, small kids education and other science fair, also the career development activities for the younger, young generation. So, um, so to start of us, I'm gonna uh, to set a stage for you uh, a little bit around the landscape look like. Um, so you may be familiar with some of the statistics in the STEM field. You may be familiar with some of the statistics currently women make up uh, less than 30% of workforce in STEM field and the men outnumber women majoring in most of the STEM field in college and women in STEM currently makes much less than their male counterparts on average. And the changing these statistics really require discussion, um, discussing them themselves and digging in a deep, um, a deep level. So um, we are sitting down with a panelist here to discuss some of these issues. And I will be providing an introduction of each of panelists for today. So um, uh, Dr. Hee-jung Gong here from the University of Alabama. Also, we have a speaker, um, Sammi Jin. Also, we have um, Professor Yang Kim from University of Chicago as a panelist. So starting with some questions. <laughs> so we just got a, a beautiful lecture related to the um, uh, diversity, inclusion, and um, also equity issues, especially to promote uh, women and the mi minority in STEM field. The first question or the first discussion point that we're gonna do is, who is the um, woman in your life wh whose work leadership is inspiring you right now? Maybe we can start from our speaker today, <laughs> from me. Uh, so um, if you I forgot her name, um, but in the, so I have two scientists that I can mention and they are both um, uh, black, uh, black female scientist um, and one of them is in picture of sci picture a scientist and the other one is um yeah it was very brief um presentation I heard but two of them had same uh, messages that they wanted to share with students in STEM majors what they were sharing was um there are different ways to do science and meaning different motivation to do science, right? Like I want to do science because I want to use this knowledge for my community. And those professors, they were emphasizing that be confident in the way that you do science. Um, so giving that message out to younger generation of female scientists, female students in STEM was very inspiring to me. And I myself as a uh, first generation, like my parents never gone to universities, colleges, and it was hard for me to like associate myself with like getting PhD or going to graduate school um, as well. But uh, my big motivation to pursue doctoral study was actually to research about women and first generation students. Um, so, you know, I have this desire of contributing to my community when I study graduate, studied in graduate programs. So that those two women stood up and I'm gonna shortly put their names in the chat after this, yeah. Okay, sounds great. How about, how about you, Dr. Gong? Um, I have um, Dr. Gong is now in Seoul, so there is some time lag. <laughs> so please understand it. Yeah. Sorry, so yeah, I have come across a few professors or senior scholars who have balanced family life, child care, and career throughout their um, entire academic journey. 
um, in academia, as you might know, like many talented women often give up their degrees or careers due to family or child issues, which is not as common for men. Um, therefore, personally, the presence of women scholars who successfully manage multiple roles in their lives um, motivates me, really. Great. Uh, how about um, Dr. Kim? Um, my collaborators. Um, yes. They, you know, so I've been working really large collaboration uh, and uh, the especially uh, the a few people, a few women who have been working very closely. Uh, we are each other sort of helping and inspiring. <laughs> so I think I tend to I have a people just around me and, and constantly interact interactions. You know, it's a, often you have a really role model and you hear once and, and okay, you got excited, but of course they, uh, you don't get to see them often. But uh, uh, those people that I've been working closely with, uh, they are always around me. So there is a constant through our conversations and, and the collaboration and working together, uh, which each other really help and support and inspire. Yeah, when, when we talk with many other uh, wonderful women scientists, engineer, engineers around us, we always, the conclusion is let's help each other, let's empower each other. That was the, our um, conclusion. It was more talk and be talks, I think. So the next question oh, will be, um, about the inclusive colleagues, how we can be more inclusive colleagues. The helping, um, there is two ways. So everything, uh, words and language matter. Of course, the content is more important, but we can fix our language more inclusive way. So the first item, uh, first, uh, um, the topic that we can think about is use gender inclusive language in our classroom teaching setting or everyday um, you know, life. For example, using people instead of guys, we always say, oh, hi guys. And um, yeah, what's up guys? But you know, instead of guys, use the people. Uh, sometimes it, it's not really familiar with, but Let's try that. And the other second one is assess your vocabulary very carefully. Many common slang words have other connotations or origins and should be avoided. For example, the word lame duck lame is often used to describe something as boring or monotonous, but it was originally used for effort to individual with impaired mo mobility. So the language really matter and vocabulary really matter. So we wanna make sure about that. As Maybe a, I can citizen. have a couple of examples. I agree exactly. totally with you. Um, so it's uh, almost 20 years ago, I was uh, elected by our collaboration to lead the, uh, um, the experiment. We call that uh, spokesman because until I got elected, there's always a male. So people always say spokesman. And then now I got elected. So I changed to a spokesperson because it's, again, the language really, it, it, it's, you can get brainwashed but through language. So that's one thing. Another one, when I became department chair, um, it was in, in, it's, uh, about 10 years ago uh, here at Chicago. Uh, until then, always chairman. So when I became chair, uh, chair, and it's still my colleagues are calling me chairman, and I said, no, just a chair or chairperson. So I changed the, uh, that. I think it, it took about a year, but everybody changed from chairman to chair. So I think you are right. Um, language matters because <laughs> it really uh, brainwash uh, people's minds and, and all that. So uh, it's important a step to take. Thank you for the, for those comments. So um, although we we panelists lead the discussion, but um, the all audience are welcome to jump in and uh, um, you know talk a little bit about 
uh, opinions and comments or questions or oh I don't think so kind of comments also very welcome so uh, please jump in whenever you have some uh, opinion and comments on the topics so the next question will be the how can the STEM industry non-academia or academia take culturally responsive approaches so about these questions um um, Dr. Jin, what do you think? <laughs> yes, uh, so, you know, culturally responsive approach is very difficult because um, we have diverse culture in the U.S. So first is to really be uh, attentive of all the differences or the commonalities of the cultures across, in, uh, across the cultures um, that exist in the U.S. And so that we can, you know, identify, oh, those are the values of my students um, with this characteristics value very often in their studies, in their development, in their work. Um, so try, and then the, so because there are infinite characteristics of cultures, um, we have to be very humble. Um, so I think it's very okay to ask um, students or colleagues, um, about their values uh, and what motivates them to pursue, persist through STEM industry and majors and try to reflect those values in the work or, and also very important thing is actually um, to reflect those values in the promotion policy and rewarding policy. Because oftentimes um, when uh, women of color, they do services for the communities. Um, their services are often not counted in their promotion and tenure. Uh, and I think in, even in industry, like, you know, um, like somebody um, like me, uh, Dr. John, like for example, Dr. John is giving speech about gender equity in the STEM industry. And that does not get usually credited or counted in the promotion uh, in the industry. So really shift, trying to have conversation, shifting how we can shift our promotion and tenure or rewording policy in a company or in the institution um, can be also another step to become culturally re uh, responsive. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, how about, um... How about you, Dr. Kong? Have you ever think about these um, approaches? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, so we can think about like when we teach STEM students, um, like at the beginning of uh, the semester or class, we could break the ice by conducting a brief um, closed survey or open survey that includes information about students' personal interests, uh, likes and dislikes, respons responsibilities outside of class or school, and concerns about uh, specific courses, peers, or about teachers. This way we can better understand their like life situations, their backgrounds, characteristics, and provide them with appropriate assistance. And also at the same time during class, um, we could use various learning activities such as peer discussion, anonymous questions or memos, and um, small group projects. Because all students have their own learning habits and comfort zones based on their culture or race. So it is essential to provide a diverse um, or diverse range, range of activities. So for instance, some faculty member like may believe that Asian students are shy and um, very quiet and thus do not comprehend um, the lessons well because of their limited participation. However, that assumption may not be true always, right? So as teachers, we should examine um, our own biases, recognize them and strive to create um, more like inclusive learning environments where all students with different perspective feel comfortable and participate in class um, in a variety of ways. Yeah, that's a really good um, point. Uh, do you have an opinion on this, Dr. Uh, Kim? I think it's uh, very well covered, so we can move to 
next question. yeah okay <laughs> so we also have a lot of audience here so um i i think i i recognized um um already <laughs> uh, some people uh, are uh, actually teaching at the college setting or classroom setting in academia so maybe they they have some experience or opinion about that so i want to um I want to uh, move microphone to one of them, um, Dr. Jay Park. If you are available and if you have an opinion about that, um, how we can um, promote the culturally appropriate um, the teaching in our STEM field? Do you have any opinion or experience based or data based uh, thought about it? So I think you are muted, Steer. Uh, maybe um, Joseph, ITM Joseph. The, oh, so they, they are not allowed to talk. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm asking uh, <laughs> whether. Yeah, I'm in it now. Okay, ah, right. Thank Sorry, you. Everyone. You have power. Good to see you all. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, so what's, what's new? Uh, 제가 이런 자리에서 말을 할수 있는 그런 어 퀄리피케이션이 있는지 모르겠는데 제가 퀄리피케이션이 있다면 어 할비머드 칼리지라는 곳에서 오랫동안 일을 했다는 부분인데요. 음, um, should I speak in English? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I think that would be better because I'll, 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 I'll switch my yeah. my language then. <laughs> okay. So I worked for Harbimad College for about 9 years. Uh, from 2010 to 2019. Um, I saw, I mean, I watched how they uh, promote women uh, in STEM. Uh, it is uh, the small college, but it is very famous college, uh, currently having 50-50% of uh, you know, male and female in their STEM. Well, Habermut College is just the STEM um, majors. Um, so what I learned uh, from the Harvey Med College about this uh, academia uh, and its responsiveness or response response uh, to uh, inappropriate um, cultural comment or behavior, you have to speak out at that moment. Uh, you so that the students know that something is not right. If, if you just pass that, um, don't say anything. The students will assume that you allow that um, mm -hmm. kinds of behavior. So also um, in, the, in the culture, you know, especially the STEM culture, when the male students uh, speak out and, you know, um, with, you know, their attitude, uh, the, the teacher, uh, the, the faculty, should suppress that uh, behavior somehow. Um, so that's what I learned. Um, and, and that was my two cents on this. OK, thank you so much. It was really a great point, I think. So the next question uh, or discussion point that we have is why is changing the ratio of women in leadership important to you and to your institute, school, or business? So, Dr. Jin. <laughs> yes, uh, but I just want to mention that I'm not doctor yet. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're almost there. Right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> just want to make sure. Uh, uh, so, I think, so I've interacted a lot of um, female students of color uh, in STEM majors because I teach course for them. And one of the also part of the, one of the, portion of the course is to actually um, engage with high school female students who are also color um, and who are interested in pursuing STEM majors. And so all my students in college level, they struggle to find or highlight uh, scientists or leaders in STEM 
were women as well as also uh, racial, racially minoritized to inspire, look, these are women like this, we can be like this. And there's so little example, very few examples. Um, my, students, my students really, really struggle when we ask, um, can you name somebody that inspires you in, the, in your field who are women and who are um, racial minoritized? Um, they struggle to find a name. So that's why um, it's very important to not just ratio, but important to improve representation of women in the leadership. Uh, it's so important to inspire um, our you know, next generation. That's right. Dr. Gong, what do you think? Um, in terms of the questions, for example, um, when I was a PhD student in my PhD program, the University of Georgia, the ratio of a male to female faculty was about like five to one, despite it being a non-STEM major, which typically has more women. Um, in, but in, interestingly, there were many female graduate students, but um, as physicians become more senior, like the ratio of women decreased significantly from student level to faculty or professional level, so to speak. Uh, and as you might know, this is not a unique story to the like educational field. Um, as a similar pattern have been observing college or universities or other many places, company or STEM related um, areas, I think. Um, so like um, it is very cr crucial to have a more women in leadership position to understand like how women can develop their careers and the change your possibility of studying or research as a woman, particularly in the US context where women of color scholars are really like underrepresented. So increasing the visibility of women or, or like people of color itself, um, particularly in leadership positions can be a powerful signal to advocate for like safe, safe, safe spaces while all like marginalized group of people in uh, diverse uh, people of color, I think. Yeah, thank you. So um, the talking of- add, uh, uh, Sure, absolutely, you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, go okay, ahead. So in addition to uh, what Sami and Hizan have mentioned, it's a very important. Um, leadership can do a lot. Even if, you know, department chair, usually don't have a much power because it's how it has to have a consensus of, of uh, your faculty make decisions. It's not like really top down. It's not, it's not line management. However, you can do a lot as, as uh, even department chair doesn't have a much of power. Um, so uh, uh, the that's something that, you know, at least I've tried my best to change and, and many ways uh, it, it, it you, you can, you can, change the culture of entire things community in your own department in your school but many others uh in terms of uh, also uh you know the uh accepting uh graduate students or recruitment for minority minorities of people and now i do now use a proper language <laughs> after i heard that from some i cannot just say uh the minorities uh, women and, and uh, underrepresented groups and all that, you you can change dramatically. So um, the, you know, the progress that one can make is, is a very slow, especially, the, you know, the issues that we are dealing with because uh, the culture doesn't change that fast. Therefore, you have to have a real, <laughs> some push uh, with the, all the, of course, trying to get people following you and, and uh, le leading others as, as an example, you have to really reduce the time it takes uh, changing the culture and leaderships uh, can really play important role. So I think it's very important. Yeah, that's very, very important, I guess. Yeah. So um, Dr. Huang Bo Pe, so you raised the hands. I think you, you have some comments on it, I guess. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so my name is Hong Bae. Um, so I am postdocing at University of Michigan, also teaching a class as a lecturer uh, at the University of Florida. Um, my question is, 
So uh, to you, Asian woman, consider yourself as a minority in our field because we have you have this dual um, intersectionality where in terms of Asian, you are overrepresented in this field. And in terms of the, your gender, you are under, well, underrepresented. And um, this question is uh, another, like one question that I received uh, when I was defending my dissertation. Like, did your participant ever talk about them being a minority? And I have few Black uh, uh, community members, and I wasn't able to like really clearly address that question. I believe all these questions are important, and I really appreciate of um, having to attend this type of workshop. But this question kind of revolves like around me. Like it's, I mean, like in terms of like black, I mean, there are like growing number of literature and movements that help improve the sports system for underrepresented minority students in our field. But how should our approach be in terms of really increasing the number of Asian women in the STEM field? Do you yourself consider yourself as minority in this field, or um, is there something else that we should include uh, to really reinforce the type of support or, or cultural changes, like things that we need to like change their culture in this field? Yeah, please jump in. <laughs> Share your opinion on it. Do you think you are the minority as an Asian Korean American? Woman in um, maybe also the participants uh, also uh, put it in the chat if uh, you know we have a lot of Asian American or Asian yeah. women in so, this group. Do you consider yourself minority at work? You can um, share your um, opinion about it first. Yeah, please share your opinion uh, in the chat. Yes or no, and why? <laughs> I think that's a very important um, point. So I had the same questions to my daughter, who is um, also Korean American woman in science and engineering, and a little um, kid, right? So when he she was like six, seven years old, I asked the same question: Do you think I am? Am I the uh, the minority still? So her her answer was pretty um, straightforward. Look around your department, for example, your school, how many Korean American are there? How many Asian American women are there? How many Asian American are there compared to mere um, uh, white, uh, Jewish, because I'm in the medical center, medical field, everybody is Jewish. Um, so you are the probably only one Asian American or um, Korean um, American who is immigrant. So you are minor, you are minority. Why are you are asking about that? <laughs> I'm not sure that is correct answer to you, but you know, that was very simple and very strong answer uh, going, going, went through the, all my career. So the Asians in US, uh, is it like six or seven percent? Did I get it right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Something like, like five. That. So in, that yeah. sense, in that sense, the uh, Asians are minority. Um, I think it's also what, what people often get confused is that if you look at Asian, let's say, students who are uh, majoring STEM fields, the they are actually the fraction is larger than six or seven percent. So at the uh, students level, looks like you know Asian STEM students are proportionally much higher than others. So in, in that sense, um, the not underrepresented, over probably represented. However, if you look at a, a higher level, people who go to promotion and, and the leadership role, there Asians in general is really struggling. Um, it's a lot of social issues. Um, 
you know, there was a the study done by a National Science Foundation. So they divided in six uh, racial groups and gender ratio, white men, woman, black men, woman, Hispanic men and women, Asian men and women. This also look at the academia, industry, governments, all you know, different areas of careers everywhere. The, uh, uh, if you look at the promotion or take getting leadership uh, fraction, Asian woman is a bottom out of six. Category Asian men is a second bottom. So what that tells you that is that even though uh, the uh, people, the, the major stems quite a bit, if you, the Asian community, how much they, uh, after they, you know, became faculty or, or working in industry in STEM field, how they promoted that fraction is uh, substantially low for Asians. So that's, yeah. that's a kind of different issue than, uh, you know, so, so uh, this is something that um, we should pay attention to. Yeah, there is a lot of opinion um, in the chat box and, you know, thanks so much for your oral opinion. Um, there is no um, answer, correct answer, yes or no, but uh, we we need to, uh, we need to keep this point, um, we need to keep discussing, discuss, discussing on this point because mm -hmm. this is yeah. really important. Mm -hmm. um, as everybody agree here in the chat box, um, it looked okay when you were kind of undergraduate students or even high school, you are the best, best, per, best student who has the highest score, the biggest achievement. But when we go up to the leader, leadership letter, you will realize, oh, I'm minor. <laughs> I'm minority. I, I'm in the minority side, um, not really strong uh, side. So, um, and then let's move on. Um, um, we, can I mention something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So maybe um, I did some mistake, right? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm sure, we made. No. I made mistake. No, I just. I know. Uh, so <laughs> we need to be careful about the language, but no, it's not. No, no, no. So I just want to, like, you know, summarize and add something onto uh, what you guys already talked about. So when we, when it comes to see if it is minoritized or not, there are three things we can think about. One, um, you already mentioned leadership. Do you see uh, Asian American women in leadership in your field that you can also easily name the person? Um, and second, um, their financial, like um, how much they earn compared to women, a man or Asian man in the same field. And then third is representation in media or academia. So meaning that Asian women in STEM, they are not studied because of the our conventional perception that Asians are, they are doing fine. But that's not true. So if you go, go to Google Scholar and search Asian American women in STEM, there are very few, only few studies available um, that I can rely on. So, but when you read those articles, you will find out that, oh, Asian and women Americans, um, Asian American women are not okay in STEM field. Their experiences are very oppressed because people like, oh, you're Asian American woman. Like you should be fine. Like your opinion, like your experience doesn't matter. Like compared to us, um, it's, it's gonna be fine. So that's why their ex expression is often oppressed because they're stereotyped as model minority. So that's another concern. So in academia, like the underrepresentation in the study, that's also another indication that Asian American women are underrepresented, although there are a lot of them in the field. Yeah. Thank you for all your um opinion about this and let's move on a little bit to the allyship one of the our topics in this workshop so there are seven examples of what being a ally, ally at work really looks like so there is many types of allies so an ally is someone who is not a member of an underrepresented group but who takes action to support um support that group. The active allies utilize their credibility to create a more inclusive workplace where everyone can drive and find ways to make their privileged work for others. 
here are a few roles that Alice can choose to play. You can choose one of the roles. Uh, choose a play to support the colleagues from the underrepresented group in beneficial way. So let's see that. Uh, first, you can be sponsor. You can be the champion. You can be the amplifier, advocate. You can choose to be a scholar. You can be the upstander and you can be the confident. So that is the um, different types of allies. So best allies, who is the best allies? We as allies acknowledge when we are wrong or could do better and correct our course. We are willing to make mistakes and keep trying. We resist getting defensive and insisting that we are already doing enough. We listen and learn, we iterate. So um, to be a good ally, um, how we can um, do that? Uh, how we can do to keep the actions in everyday, uh, everyday life at school or at work? So maybe you have some, you guys, you have some experience and now um, uh, about this. And we have Johnny Kim here. So <laughs> if you do not mind, you, do you want to share the, your um, experience related to the allyship? Johnny, can you? Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, <laughs> I suppose um, growing up in this country as a you know model minority male. Uh, or it's uh, it's something you hear a lot. What can you do better? Uh, hey, how can you help us? And then eventually also it comes from my own heart too. It's like, how can I help? How can I make sure that how I use my language, how I represent um, not just my race, but also um, in any way, my colleagues uh, affects how others perceive our groups, whether that's Asian, whether that's males, that, whether that's students, whether that's industry. And so it's interesting um, throughout my life, uh, I just do my best, but I'm always learning, uh, keeping myself open to um, be wrong. Uh, and then where I feel I am right to stand my ground. And I feel like following those two rules have helped me a lot. Uh, and I just, um, that's why I liked uh, attending seminars like this where I can continue to hear many different perspectives and being open to learning and and then taking it out and apply. I live in Florida. Uh, you know, earlier today, I even had a conversation with two males where, ooh, International Women's Day, don't you know that's a communist and socialist route and stuff like that, a very un-American holiday, don't even call it a holiday. And I had to sit there and be like, well, I mean, conceptually, don't you agree of the equity and the value of the diversity there? And uh, they met me halfway. But these are the kinds of conversations I deal with my, I guess, so-and-so called teammates, my side of. And so, you know, the, the fight rages on, but we can only do our best and be open to new conversations. Thank you. So how about other people's um, opinion about that allyship, how we can promote this allyship? Um, Dr. Song Ju Kim, if you are available, uh, if you have some opinion on that, would you mind to share yours? Um, thank you, Dale Giant called me, and I'm not planning to do the talks in this seminar, uh, but uh, as I am in the social science, the study about human rights and social justice, uh, I definitely agree with the the women's being the historically is less highlighted and the disadvantages than compared with the others. And also, a um, couple of things that I'm gonna share. Uh, uh, first one is I've been studies to the investigators the attitude for the diversities, inclusions, and equities uh, for the college students recently, and I finding out that. Uh, STEAM students, the science and engineer students, has significantly less the uh, favor about the diversities and inclusions and the uh, equity, especially for the, the gender equities as well. So uh, is is the because compared with the students from the other disciplines like the social sciences, the one of the reasons the why that the STEAM students has a, a low levels of understanding or favors towards the DI 
uh, because the, they haven't to have any education programs about the, the DEIs or the human rights or equal rights by gender uh, in their educational path and educational program. That is the very significant uh, issues for the, the DEI. And also the things the um, uh, I'm gonna share the one things that last year the Simons the Simonsonians that showed at the 120s uh, the the female scientist they actually made the real size the 3D print statues the photo the female scientist most of them were white uh, female scientist and there were there were very few of the colored the female scientists so. Within the women's, the still in the majority societies, the the only the interest no the more interesting about the the white female scientists. So the Asians of the the women scientists is still less a highlight among the women issues as well. So the, because of this, I think uh, uh, the educational approaches from the, the bachelor level to the, the, the PhDs or beyond uh, is more is very important to addressing these issues. And then the, the another part, the part I want to share because the Dr. Bayes ways, I just shared the little the comments from uh, on the chat. Uh, generally is the African Americans the, uh, has some perspective about the Asians or the others. Uh, colors peoples that does not have some minorities the situation because the they thought the Asians, especially the Asians, the start to follow their careers with the advanced circumstance and advanced situations. So they thought the Asians never be minorities to compare with the African Americans. That's very um the stereotypes from the the the, the African Americans the site perspective. Uh, this is the definitely very narrow uh, thin perspective to see the minorities. So I think that we have to ex uh, extending the frames and the boundary of minorities and conceptual of minorities to the, the others, the uh, other minorities as well, and also the, to the, the majority society. So I think it's the education, it is the key uh, to further the, this issues, allies and also the inclusive and equities and you know, diversities as well. Thank you. Right, so it, it would be another question, um, what would be the ways to be more inclusive colleagues? So let's talk a little bit about the inclusion. So what do you think, Dr. Um, Kong, you first? <laughs> um, so as an international woman Asian researcher, um, think by myself, um, I strive to collaborate with people from diverse backgrounds, such as uh, those with different race, gender, majors, or nationalities, in other words, more inclusive with these of um, the collaborations um, and tour for underrepresented individuals, such as international students or Asian um, students, to strengthen allyship and collegial um, relationships. Okay, thank you. How about um not the doc, not doctor but uh Jean <laughs> almost to be there. <laughs> um, so, so Thank me. you. Um, so for me, like I also had the incident that I my um my female supervisor. So I had two like several supervisors that I worked with, and um one of the the supervisors were a uh, woman of color. Was it woman of color? And I felt there was something going on. And so I reached out to her to see if that situation, I felt something weird about was okay with her. Just to, you know, sometimes people don't express they are not okay with it um, at the first. So I wanted to check in with her if she was all right in that moment. And she said, no, she wasn't. 
So I got consensus that she wasn't okay too. And I wasn't okay either. Um, but oftentimes people just go their way because the person didn't express anything. But at least like checking in with the person who might feel uh, violated um, is a good start to have conversation and that person feel acknowledged. So that's one way to be more inclusive colleague. And I, as women too, we have to support each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. So let's, uh, let me uh, tweak the question a little bit. Um, so for the Dr. Kim, what would be the ways um, to be more inclusive society, um, KSEA? how KAC could be more inclusive society. I, I know so we are very homogeneous group, right? <laughs> well, I guess within KCA inclusive, for example, in different uh, age generations, and also uh, there's uh, industry versus uh, academia. So that's also uh, different. So I think that we, even though, primarily Koreans, uh, but in terms of uh, work we do, in terms of uh, what level, stage of their career, uh, it's very different. And also it's a first generation and 1.5 generation, second generation, that's also, there are different culture. So we are quite, in a sense, diverse. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I wish I know the answer, but I think, um, we have to really open to uh, listen uh, the, you know, the needs of each different groups. Um, but that's, a, I think, a very important step to, without knowing, you cannot take any actions. That's so right. I think we should be able to uh, hear each other. So, so, so uh, I think this is a, one of the steps that uh, we should pursue. And we have a, a very... Um, active and, and very helpful uh, next generation directors. And we have also uh, EDI task force. So we do some of them, uh, those activities, to make sure that we'll get uh, better. But I think we are a long way to go still. Yeah, that at least we, we started to think about, um, about it, inclusion and diversity and equity issues at as a team of KSEA, who, 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 we, we are the, the um, most privileged um, society among Korean American science and scientists and engineering. So we need to um, show some actions about that. So the last questions, how can your efforts for diversity in STEM contribute to your career leading more equitable labs or classroom, becoming a leader and so on. How um, our effort for diversity will be helpful to your career. So uh, let's think about that as well. So do you have any comments on that? This is last question, last chance to share your opinion. We are very um, welcome. Um, any quickly. opinions from audience? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, love. yeah. Uh, there are many ways to um, promote the diversity inclusion. Uh, one of the, the ways we, uh, we applied was to give um, uh, diversity point uh, for those um, uh, new students higher so that we can give more points uh, to female and the colored people, colored students uh, when we hire them. So, and I was surprised that it is not uh, discrimination. So it, it is allowed, actually. So um, as long as you uh, publicly say that we will only hire, you know, certain, um, you know, demographics, it is not, yeah, it is not a, a legal thing. Any other opinions? Uh, Dr. Bae, what do you think? Oh, I was kind of surprised, but uh, um, how can your efforts be there? Um, 
It's well, not the think... SAT test, so you can pass it. <laughs> no, <laughs> Feel free I'm to, to... <laughs> no, I'm grateful that I've, I was pointed. But uh, um, one thing that I think I can do myself uh, to uh, develop more inclusive kind of classroom is really uh, um, communicating that clearly with students the beginning that my classroom is designed um, as a safe environment where your perspectives and like um, insights will not be judged or will be shared and discussed openly and that way students are more encouraged to throw their ideas and just let go from there so they're not really afraid of speaking up and i'm not really like and yeah i'm not um putting them in a in a spotlight that their answer should be right. Um, so I think that's a, that's one way. Another way is, uh, I think we, kind of, we sort of discussed in an earlier question, I see myself as an ally, because um, I, I am a Asian male. I am overreached in my field. So, um, but uh, the, the, the struggles, the difficulties that Asian women and women of color experience in their field um it's just heartbreaking and i stand as an ally with them so if they need to really loud their voice their position i'm here to support them so i'm making that clear with my students and also with my uh, fellow colleagues uh, in my field thank you dr jin what do you think me right <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, so I think so this I think some people question like if I commit myself for diversity, is it gonna be helpful for my career? Like because I have to do research and my work for diversity doesn't get recognized. But in some sense, there are growing interest in improving diversity in STEM. So when you are appointed, nominated as leader in your society or in your field, your efforts for diversity is going to be more and more recognized. And also by expanding diversity, improving diversity, you are also encouraging diversity of thoughts. So becoming more innovative, you can lead um, more innovative team and less students. So, you know, one of the book that I have recently read is Homo Science in Korean. That's Homo Science. That's a book. And in the book, um, these scientists, they talk about their findings and research they, they developed with a perspective of women. Right. So that in a way, as you are promoting diversity, you are promoting excellence in innovation. So that's going to be very helpful for your career as well. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Um, I totally agree. Uh, I think for leadership role, either leading your research team or your, your any organization, I think uh, your team gets stronger. Uh, with a diverse uh, background, the diverse ideas. So I think that's very important. But even uh, even not there. I mean, these days, as as uh, um, Sami has mentioned, that there's a uh, a lot of effort going on everywhere. Even the the uh, um, you know the academia faculty searches or postdoc searches level. You know, many universities are now requiring diversity statement. And if you haven't thought about it, of course, maybe you can find some sentence from, from you know, here and there, but that, that's not the real you. So that that's, it shows up. And, and I think if you are not conscious about that, you will actually have a, uh, again, I cannot say ev about every uh, jobs, but many academia postdoc jobs and, and, and uh, for example, I would not hire any of my postdocs or students who are, <laughs> you know, it, it's it has no um, the, the how to say 
no effort of inclusion and diversity. I was not uh, the higher that kind of person in my in my group. So I think this is not much broader uh, the spectrum and, and effort is even, you know, many other areas. So this will be something uh, everybody should think about. Yeah, great point. So any other uh, questions or opinions from audience or panelists? So because we are almost closing um, now, so I just uh, wanna thank you. Thank all of our panelists for joining us today and thank everybody listening for their um, time and really excited to celebrate International Women's Day today. And uh, hopefully this is just the starting off <laughs> a good point of the conversation that we can have within our own, your own workplace and or school and your family and your institute and uh, every daily uh, life. So, um, Dr. Kim, would you would you like to um, do the closing for this yeah, session? Yeah, I'd like or, to thank yeah. uh, all our speaker and panel members and also uh, participants. I think it was a very nice conversation, and and I'm also very appreciated that we have a number of male colleagues in this uh, audience because you know this is an issue. It's issue of everybody, and we are talking about woman issue among two only women we are just preaching the choir <laughs> we don't get big improvement we need allies a male ally that's very very important so i have a i would like to uh, uh give a special thanks to our male the colleagues are joining today's session and thank you very much thank you thank you so much everyone thanks